Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Huang Ping. Tonight for our ninth uh, South South Forum on Sustainability, we are very honored to have the opportunity to actually listen to Professor Michael Hudson, who is the president of the Institute for the Study of Long-Term Economic Trends. Uh, let me very simply introduce him to all the audience. Uh, for many, there is no need to introduce him since he has been also quite well known around the world, including China. Uh, some of his works was also translated into Chinese. So very briefly, Professor Michael Hudson is the president of the Institute for the Study of the Long-Term Economic Trade. It's called ISLET. Uh, also, Wall Street financial analyst. He's a distinguished research professor of the economics of the, at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He has also been the authors of many books, including the Dynasty of Civilization, Finance, Capitalism, Industrial Capitalism or Socialism. This was in both English and Chinese. And the Super Imperialism, J is for Junk Economics, Killing the Host, the bubble and the beyond, super imperialism, the economic strategy of American empire, trade, development, and the foreign debt, and of the myth of the eight, uh, among, of course, among many others. He's deeply engaged in research regarding domestic as well as international finance, national income, and the balance sheet accounting. With regard to the real estate, the economic history of the ancient Near East, he has also consulted governments on finance and tax policy. And also he gives presentations all over the world. So let's have the honor to invite Professor Michael Hudson. His topic tonight is the end of the Western civilization, question mark. Now, Michael, please, Professor Hudson. Well, as Professor Wen said uh, last Saturday on uh, this site, today's world is dividing between two opposing camps and the antagonism between the United States and China is not simply rivals for the same system uh, competing to make companies. Uh, it's a clash of economic systems. The United States is not trying to become a manufacturing power. It's voluntarily deindustrialized itself and given that role to China to avoid having to pay wages to its own labor force. So uh, the US corporations make profits by deindustrializing the economy not by industrializing it. The question is, how is an, a country that's deindustrializing going to get most of the wealth of the whole world, China's wealth, Russia's wealth, Europe's wealth, the global South wealth, how will it get all into itself if it doesn't have any industry, if all it is has is military power and uh, control of the oil trade? You can think of America as uh, uh, President Obama and uh, John McCain, uh, characterized Russia. It's an oil station with atom bombs. Uh, now, China's not trying to make money primarily financially. It, 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 uh, when the central bank of China creates money, it's not to buy stocks and bonds to push up the value of the stocks and bonds that a financial class has, as in the United States. Uh, it's planning to spending money into the economy as a whole to develop infrastructure, to create uh, the basic needs 
uh, to create what a, an economy physically and tangibly needs to go forward. So in the very first look, you're, uh, it, this seems to be a conflict between finance capitalism in the United States and industrial socialism in China. But what I want to talk about today is it goes further than this. Uh, the uh, Professor Huang mentioned my background as an economist, but for 25 years, I worked out with Harvard University's anthropology department, uh, putting together a group of uh, Assyriologists, Egyptologists, and archeologists, writing a history of how did the economic practices of civilization actually begin. And uh, when you look at this, you realize that uh, Eurasia, the whole world, uh, up until classical Greece and Rome, up until about 2000 years ago, the whole world had a similar philosophy. It was not a financial philosophy. The whole idea is how do you keep an economy stable and avoid the maldistribution uh, of land? Uh, all of this changed in uh, the Western civilization. And I want to emphasize how much different Western civilization has been for 2000 years. And the, uh, America's fight for neoliberalism isn't simply a fight for what is happening in America. It's a fight for what happened in the Roman Empire. Because the United States today is taken over by a military oligarchy that's very much like the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, it's, it, it's not making money at home because the financial oligarchy has uh, impoverished the rest of the economy. That's what happened in Rome. And the only way the United States or Rome or all of the empires in between, England, Holland, Spain, could make money was by exploiting foreign countries. So that's the real difference between uh, um, the United States and China today. China is trying to make prosperity at home, not to extract it from other countries. The United States uh, and the Western countries, Europe, the NATO countries can no longer make prosperity at home. All they can do is take, and all they can do is enforce this, is to try to convince other countries that their way of doing something uh, is uh, really uh, the, the best way to do it. And, uh, we know that that uh, was a failure in history, and that's what I want to talk about. So suppose you're uh, 2,500 years ago, and uh, you're the ruler of any country. Every, uh, the great challenge facing every society in history has been, uh, how do you conduct trade and uh, credit without letting merchants and creditors make money by exploiting their customers and debtors? Uh, this was the problem that uh, uh, ancient China had 2,000 years ago, India had. Uh, almost every country put creditors and uh, merchants at the bottom of the social scale. The idea was to prevent debt from growing up, to prevent uh, people making money financially in a way that exploited uh, other people. And all of antiquity, if you look at the philosophers of, uh, from Greece and Rome all the way to Lao Tse, to uh, Buddha, uh, there was a common understanding that uh, the drive to acquire money is addictive and uh, it tends to be exploitative and uh, therefore it socially injurious. If you're a low surplus society and somebody makes a lot of money, the only way to make it is by making somebody else poor. And most societies try to avoid that. Western civilization uh, in Greece and Rome was an exception. Greece and Rome uh, had uh, basically was all about exploitation. There was a, a philosophical fight over this uh, in 2,500 years ago. The Greek had a word, uh, the love of money, silver mania. Uh, wealth was addiction. Uh, and they saw that it was addiction. And how are you going to keep uh, people from wanting to get rich by exploiting others? Well, that was the Greek concept of uh, hubris. Uh, avarice and greed were uh, basically to be uh, avoided, but how do you avoid it without, uh, with, without putting in place a set of laws uh, to prevent it? Well, the way uh, ancient societies avoided this was to have uh, rulers giving them the power to prevent a oligarchy, a wealthy creditor class or a merchant class 
from coming from taking over. Uh, they were given enough power to uh, make sure that the population was free of debt, that uh, the small uh, cultivators had their own land, uh, and that they weren't all of us. They weren't going to fall into debt and become uh, bond servants or slaves of the creditors, because if they were, then they wouldn't be available to fight in the army, and they wouldn't be available to perform public corvée labor to build uh, palaces and uh, uh, roads and all of the infrastructure that uh, most countries relied on on, uh, on uh, labor. And if there were rulers to uh, avoid uh, to behave selfishly, they tended to be overthrown uh, or else the population would run away or maybe they'd support uh, a rival country that was uh, invading them. But the whole idea was that rulers uh, had to do had to promote overall prosperity. Well, that's supposed to be what democracy is all about. But democracy in the West has not been very effective in checking the emergence of a financial oligarchy. Uh, democracy really has tended to evolve into oligarchy. Uh, that's what uh, uh, Aristotle said. They evolve into oligarchy and the oligarchy tends to make itself uh, into a hereditary aristocracy. And uh, the qu uh, question is, how are you going to prevent this? Well, just imagine uh, that this was the overall morality of everybody 2,500 years ago was, how do, how do you have a fair society that keeps people from falling into bondage? Well, there was not any archaic Milton Friedman to say that greed is good. Uh, there was no concept, nobody 25 years ago would have said what the Chicago school, what the American neoliberals say. No one said, uh, everybody help society by making as much money as you can. Uh, and if you can uh, make money by making other people poor, that's Darwinian evolution and that's how societies go forward. Nobody said anything about that. All of that uh, is new, but basically uh, it all comes from uh, what happened in classical Greece and Rome that uh, was quite different from everything else. So to understand what happened in the West and where civilization went wrong 2000 years ago, uh, you have to realize that imagine the, uh, the whole map of the world on the Western periphery, there was uh, the Mediterranean and uh, the Aegean, uh, Italy and Greece. Th th this was way in the West. They were what today you would call barbarians compared to the East. Well, to uh, make uh, matters worse, in about 1200 BC, there was really bad weather. We're talking about global warming today. There was a drought and uh, the population throughout the whole Eastern Mediterranean shrank tremendously. People, uh, there were whole peoples, that uh, tr uh, tribes and groups that had to move because uh, the land wasn't producing enough to live. So uh, there was a shrinkage and uh, there had been palace economies in, uh, uh, in Mycenaean Greece and Bronze Age Greece in the uh, second millennium BC. All of these emptied out. And between 1200 BC and 750 BC, there was just uh, everything sort of uh, fell apart and there were very local warlords uh, would, would take over. And uh, around 750 BC, uh, weather began to get better again, and there began to be trade, and Syrian and Phoenician traders began to sail west uh, to trade, and they sailed to uh, Greece and Italy, and they brought civilization, uh, Eastern civilization, to the west. They, and one of the things they brought, if you're going to do trade, everything has to operate on credit. They brought the idea of charging interest uh, to the west. The, uh, the first uh, interest was developed in the Middle East, in Sumer and Babylonia, in uh, what is now Iraq, uh, by the palace economies. And uh, interest and money and the use of silver uh, and weights and measures to uh, uh, see how much silver you're exchanging, all of that was developed uh, in the Bronze Age, along with contracts uh, uh, and all of the techniques that uh, modern society uses. So all of a sudden, these uh, uh, were brought uh, to barbarian regions where uh, there were very local uh, local warlords. And uh, 
the historians of Greece in the seventh and sixth century BC call them mafia-like states. They were just a few families managed to get control of the land and they held most of the Greek population uh, in bondage, uh, in slavery. And, uh, one, and almost one country after another, uh, from uh, Sparta and Greece uh, to uh, up to uh, Athens and to the Greek islands uh, and uh, Corinth, uh, reformers came to power. Reformers overthrew through the families and uh, they were called tyrants. And tyrants mean you have enough power to overthrow the families, cancel the debts and give the land to the people. Uh, they weren't democratically elected. Uh, there was no democracy yet, but by overthrowing the old mafia type uh, families, uh, they like that would be like America overthrowing the billionaires uh, today. They uh, they prepared the groundwork uh, for democracy. Uh, something very uh, they were very progressive in the seventh and sixth centuries. Something similar occurred in Rome. Uh, Rome's history uh, talks about the kings, and uh, the kings made Rome uh, a very powerful country by giving everybody land. Uh, nobody wanted to live where Rome was because it was uh, near the Tiber River and there were a lot of mosquitoes there and it was uh, very hilly land. Uh, and so uh, they, uh, uh, the, they, the leaders said, okay, we're, uh, anybody who wants to come, we're going to give land, uh, we're going to give them their own land, uh, they can become our citizens. If you're being enslaved, by your local uh, uh, mafia-like leaders in uh, Etruria and the rest of uh, Italy come to us. And so uh, P uh, Ro Rome became a magnet for immigrants and they grew. And uh, the, uh, the king said, how are we going to prevent an oligarchy from developing? Well, Ro uh, every Roman king uh, was not chosen from the rich people, from uh, the wealthy families. Every king was appointed from another, another city-state so that they wouldn't have any loyalty to a particular family. And that was Rome's great period of growth and under the kings, not the democracy. But in 509 BC, the, king, the oligarchy overthrew the kings. They said, the kings are arrogant. They're trying to tell the oligarchy what to do. It was a violent revolution. The oligarchy took over and wrote a constitution that was different from what had been everywhere else in the world. Uh, everywhere else in the world, had debt cancellations regularly. All throughout uh, uh, the Near East, every ruler who would come to power would cancel the debts, redistribute the land to prevent an oligarchy from ending up with the land, to prevent an oligarchy from ending up with uh, the labor. But uh, uh, in Rome uh, and Greece, they had no tradition of palace rulers doing this because they didn't have palaces, because all they had were the local barbarian uh, uh, chieftains. Well, the barbarians took over and they said, uh, we're going to have a different rule. Uh, all the debts have to be paid. If uh, anyone wants to cancel the debts, uh, well, we're going to assassinate them. And for five centuries, uh, there were debt revolts in Rome and Greece. Populations kept revolting, saying, we want to cancel the debts and give us the land. Again and again, the revolts were put down uh, and the oligarchy got stronger and stronger and uh, created a Senate that didn't give any uh, democratic uh, privileges uh, at all uh, uh, to the people. You, could, you had to vote for a, uh, uh, what was then a billionaire uh, in order to uh, uh, have a choice, but your only choice was one billionaire or another billionaire. Uh, and uh, the, the result was that uh, Rome ended up uh, conquering uh, other countries uh, because of, uh, militarily, uh, it was not producing much at home. It would conquer other countries. It would loot all of their money, their, uh, loot their temples, loot the palaces, melt down the gold and silver. And uh, that's how uh, Rome uh, was able to uh, build up its, its money supply, not by trade, but by military force. Uh, you may begin to see a parallel with uh, the modern United States, but the same thing happened in, with uh, Spain in the 16th century when it discovered the New World. Uh, the, it happened uh, with England uh, and England's empire, uh, uh, and it, it happened again today. So if you understand how the Western civilization developed in a way that contained the seeds of 
it's failure today, uh, it's decline and fall. Uh, you have to realize that uh, it, in the historical record, Rome and Greece were the only countries to begin privatizing what was public in other countries. Uh, they didn't have any palace ruler to uh, run things, and they didn't have any communist party or group of uh, trained uh, technicians to say, here's how uh, we're going to plan a society uh, to go ahead. Uh, they, it was basically uh, an autocracy, uh, a landed aristocracy that uh, really uh, ended up leading to feudalism. Well, the, right now uh, in the United States, uh, the neoliberals uh, have their kind of Bible, and it's a book by uh, Frederick Hayek called The Road to Serfdom. And he said the road to serfdom is a strong government. By a strong government, he meant a government strong enough to prevent an oligarchy from taking over, to prevent a financial class from taking over, getting uh, the rest of the population in debt, and then reducing it to debt bondage, and taking the land, and uh, uh, making other uh, clients uh, just dependent on uh, uh, the landowners. Well, the result of all this in Rome was the real serfdom. Uh, the Rome, uh, Roman economy declined and fell, and uh, that uh, uh, led to serfdom. Uh, so serfdom is the result of the oligarchy taking over and impoverishing uh, uh, the economy. And essentially, that's what's hap been happening uh, to the United States and Europe since uh, 2008. And uh, what uh, distinguishes the Western uh, society from uh, well, Asian society and the Near East was the absence of debt relief to restore balance. Uh, all throughout uh, Asia for 2000 years, uh, uh, when there would be a crop failure or uh, a, a disease, uh, the rulers would, cancel, would say, okay, uh, we have to cancel the debts and everybody starts all, all over again uh, afresh because otherwise you, you would have most of the population falling in debt to a ruling aristocracy. And uh, uh, under Confucianism, uh, you, you would have uh, uh, the uh, getting a public position uh, by general testing in a, a democratic way. Nothing like that occurs uh, in the United uh, States today. It's uh, more or less education has become hereditary. And in order to get an education to become a manager of a corporation or a country, uh, you have to run into very heavy debt, so heavy debt that uh, if you're a student graduating in the United States and you don't inherit from your family a large amount of money, you won't, won't have enough uh, uh, income to buy a house, uh, even on mortgage, banks won't lend to you. So uh, basically the financial colonization uh, 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 the, that's occurred of, of the country impoverished uh, the country. Well, all of a sudden, all of in, uh, you can look at the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and you can say, it's really bad to, ha to have a greedy, self-serving oligarchy trying to get rich itself instead of make the whole economy better because that collapses the economy. Well, that's not what uh, is taught in uh, the universities. Uh, if you look at, uh, go to a uh, American university and either study economics or study political science, you find that the great victory of neoliberalism, if they could create a, a, what they think is a perfect world, look at what happened in the one country they had a free hand in reshaping, the Soviet Union under Boris Yeltsin, with, uh, where American advisors went and said, uh, what you have to do is get rid of the state. You can't have a state because if you had a state, that would uh, uh, prevent private banks from taking over. That would uh, uh, prevent uh, uh, a domestic billionaire class. So uh, uh, the neoliberals from the United States said, told the managers of the uh, uh, Russian companies, why don't you register uh, your gas, your oil, your nickel, your public utilities, all in your own names. And instead of belonging to the state, it'll belong to you personally. And now that you, and so they did that, they uh, said, okay, we've issued stock. We own it all personally. 
And then the Americans said, well, nobody has any money uh, in Russia uh, uh, to give value to all these thefts because we've had uh, the uh, cra uh, crash therapy uh, there. And so the only way you can make money on all these companies that you've privatized is to sell to the Americans. And so uh, the Russian uh, kleptocrats who uh, gave their uh, uh, registered property in their own name began to sell their companies to uh, the Americans. Russia became the world's leading stock market in 1980, uh, 1995, 1996. Uh, it soared and uh, uh, Michael Kartakovsky, who headed Yukos uh, Oil, planned to sell uh, the whole company to Exxon, uh, the oil company here. And uh, America would have ended up with all of uh, Russia's resources. So the ideal of neoliberals, where they had the ideal plan, was essentially the Americans end up buying all of your resources. It's as if the Americans went to China and said, uh, uh, we think the head of your electric company should uh, just give himself all the shares and now let him sell these shares to Americans and we'll own it. The head of your railroad would uh, give, him, give uh, the railroad managers all the shares and they'd sell it to the United States. That would, that would be what the Americans wanted and that's what they actually expected to happen in China when it was uh, invited into the, to join the World uh, Trade Organization uh, in 2001. The idea was that uh, China, if it uh, followed the neoliberal uh, plans of, of world trade, would end up uh, basically being a financial colony of the United States. And the United States is different from ancient Spain or uh, Rome or uh, England by, it doesn't have a military occupation there. It, it, it uh, establishes its power financially. Uh, and that's what makes uh, the American uh, 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 unipolar world order so central that the whole world operates in dollars now that are created essentially by the United States uh, by computers and put into circulation by uh, America's military bases all over the world uh, being spread. So uh, uh, the United States is uh, able, for instance, to uh, tell uh, the global South countries, well, listen to the advice that the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank gives you. Uh, don't feed yourself, uh, buy in the cheapest market, buy American grain, and you should use your land to make plantation export crops. Uh, you, you have to prevent local land reform. You, have, you must not grow your own food. Uh, you must depend on the United States. Uh, and uh, you have to essentially uh, uh, do to your economy, what happened in Russia, which is exactly what the University of Chicago boys did in Chile after the United States uh, uh, assassinated its uh, democratically elected leader, Allende, and put uh, Pinochet uh, in power. Uh, the ideal of U the US uh, uh, foreign policy is colonialist because it's willing to engage in regime change. Uh, its policy is to assassinate uh, every foreign leader that is unwilling to, uh, to let America come in and privatize uh, its uh, public uh, utilities and uh, uh, sell these off to the United States. Uh, well, obviously, uh, this is, you can see that in uh, the new Cold War uh, with Ukraine right now. Uh, President Biden has said we need regime change in Russia. Won't somebody shoot President Putin? Uh, we've got to get rid of him. He's uh, uh, a new Hitler. And uh, uh, the uh, Hillary Clinton uh, keeps calling Putin a, a Clinton, uh, uh, a Hitler. They are essentially calling for uh, assassination. They are trying to back uh, terrorist groups in Russia, uh, in China, uh, all around uh, in, in Venezuela, Latin America, uh, all to force uh, what we call client oligarchies, to make these uh, countries dependent on the United States. Uh, that's a completely different system from uh, uh, China's uh, Belt and Road. Uh, and this is why the United States said, uh, has announced that uh, China is the number one enemy of the United States. It's an enemy in the sense that it has a different economic system. 
And if the United States and the European economies are shrinking with unemployment, with uh, inflation, we call it stagnation here, uh, stagflation, stagnation and inflation, while the United States and Europe are uh, going further and further into debt and shrinking, China is going forward and building up its economy and building up the economies of its uh, partner countries along the Belt and Road. Well, this is a threat to the United States because if you're Africa or Latin America, uh, South America uh, or uh, South Asian countries, uh, who are you going to want your economy to look like? Are you going to want your economy to look like the United States uh, with uh, more and more uh, economic polarization, a financial class that's getting rich, uh, and the 99% of the population further and further in debt? Or are you going to want to look like China uh, going forward and actually increasing your means of production uh, and living standards? Well, uh, as long as China exists to, as a success story, the, uh, the Americans call that an existential threat because the threat is one of, uh, uh, of how the economy is organized. And, uh, Again, if you look at history, which I'm now going to uh, take a long view of, uh, th this is not simply a United States policy alone. alone. This has been the policy of Western countries for 2000 years. It was a policy of Rome. It was a policy of feudalism in feudal Europe. Uh, it was the policy of uh, 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 the Spanish conquest of uh, uh, Latin America, taking the silver and gold, uh, that went right through its hands. Uh, uh, it just dissipated it all. It was a policy of uh, Holland, of, of England. Uh, it, it's a way of organizing society to permit uh, the forward planning and the wealth to be taken by the financial sector, not by government. Uh, in the United States, uh, the whole idea of the Federal Reserve Bank in uh, 1913 just before World War I began, was to shift policymaking away from Washington to New York City uh, by creating a private Federal Reserve to do what the US Treasury had used to be, do used to be doing. Well, Rome never was a democracy. Uh, as I told you, Aristotle said, well, democracies evolve into oligarchy. And uh, that's exactly what's happening today. But uh, President Biden, and the State Department neoliberals accused China and other com any country trying to maintain its own economic independence and self-reliance of being autocratic. So what does, uh, there's a rhetoric here, a kind of Orwellian vocabulary uh, of, that juxtaposes democracy to autocracy. Well, what they call autocracy is a government strong enough to defend against a Western-oriented <clears throat> excuse me, financial oligarchy from uh, indebting the population to itself and then prying away uh, uh, the land and other property into its own hands. Uh, so uh, what a democracy uh, is uh, whatever uh, the American uh, government uh, and Wall Street says uh, should be the leader. Uh, America said, uh, let's tell you what democracy is in Venezuela. It's not who you Venezuelans elect as president. And so we appoint as president and we've appointed our, uh, Mr. Guaido as uh, president because he's promised to do to Chile, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to your country, to Venezuela, exactly what General Pinochet did to Chile. So we've appointed him to president. That's democracy. And the opposition is the autocracy you now have in Venezuela, a country that says, no, you can't take over. Uh, the, uh, our oil wealth belongs to the government to be used for the people. Uh, that is uh, defined as autocracy, not democracy. Uh, and uh, being able to vote for your president is not democracy unless it's uh, appointed by the United States uh, oligarchy. So you have to go through the uh, language here. Well, th this uh, st contrast between democracy and autocracy is exactly the rhetoric that was used in ancient Rome and Greece. There were many democratic reformers in Rome uh, that tried to take over and they were killed for saying you're seeking kingship. When Julius Caesar came, uh, uh, was elected, 
he had supported uh, the uh, uh, another uh, uh, Senate uh, leader who wanted to cancel the debts uh, in, in Rome, the uh, Catiline. And uh, Catiline's followers were all murdered. Uh, and uh, Caesar was elected. And everybody thought that he was going to cancel the debts and redistribute the land. And so the oligarchy killed him. And uh, Cicero, the, uh, uh, the uh, sort of uh, hired uh, lawyer, said he wished he had been there to stick in one of the knives. They all agreed that Caesar had to be killed. The same thing happened in Greece. There were many revolutions in Greek oligarchic cities uh, uh, that, that took over. And uh, if there was a reformer saying, no, let's cancel the debts, uh, the oligarchs would say, you're seeking tyranny. You want to be a tyrant. And of course, it was the tyrants that canceled the debts. The tyrants were the Democrats of their day. The tyrants were the people trying to use the government for the people. The tyrants were like the Communist Party of, uh, of uh, China. But they were the good guys. They were the people overthrowing the mafia state, overthrowing uh, the aristocracy. And that's why this, this whole fight that you're seeing today is just a replay of uh, what happened in, in Greece and Rome. Uh, in about two months, I will be publishing uh, my history of the collapse of antiquity, uh, spelling all of this out. But uh, I think when you look at the long picture, you see that the fight between the United States and China today is really a fight of the whole dynamic of Western civilization that's based on not canceling debts, not redistributing the land, of leaving wealth in private hands. And uh, once land is sold, once you lose your money and the uh, land, you lose it irreversibly, as opposed to the whole uh, uh, circular time that you had uh, throughout uh, the Near East and Asia. So uh, the problem that, uh, is that the Western democracies have not proved adept, in pre adept at preventing oligarchies from emerging and polarizing uh, the economy. Uh, and uh, if you look at who's actually enacting and enforcing policies to seek to check the oligarchy today, uh, it's only in uh, countries that have a centralized government rather than uh, a, a democracy controlled by the US. It's in China. Uh, and uh, it, it, it may be, it could be in Russia. We don't know uh, what's going to happen there. But uh, the, nearly all of the non-Western societies had protection against the emerg emergence of a mercantile or a rentier, rentier oligarchy. And that's why it's so important to recognize that what has become Western civilization represents a break from everything that went before. And what China is trying to do with its uh, public uh, sponsorship of wealth is to pick up the whole line of where civilization seemed to be going 2,500 years ago. Nobody expected uh, civilization to, to, all, to say greed is good. Nobody expected that a civilization could survive in the way that the West has survived. That's why every country, from uh, India to uh, China, um, every country we know in Asia had uh, a ruler to try to uh, preserve widespread land holding, to preserve the economic balance so that the economy would not polarize because if it polarized, either it would uh, uh, be impoverished or the population would simply run away as they ran away uh, in, in antiquity, the problem of flight. So the question is uh, uh, fr uh, freedom or liberty? A classical political economy, uh, 19th century. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Western uh, uh, college courses, if you send your students to study economics, they talk about Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill uh, as if somehow today's economy was the kind of free market that Adam Smith and uh, Mill in the 19th century talked about. Uh, but when they talked about a free market, they meant an, a, a market free from a landlord class, free from a monopoly class, and free from private banking. A free market was one where the a government had taken over and finally freed economies from the legacy of feudalism. And it was feudalism that created a landlord class that ended up with the rents and uh, created uh, private banking, uh, largely through the Christian church itself uh, is the, and the papacy is the major bankers. Well, uh, this was to be freed. 
And all of that seemed to be where Western civilization was going in the late 19th century. It looked like finally the West was going to join the rest of civilization and pick up where it took a, a wrong detour 2,000 years ago. But then World War I happened and uh, the oligarchy fought back and the oligarchy changed the whole concept of free market. It used the same word that the Greek, that the uh, uh, classical economists used, the free market, but they meant a market free from government protecting the population. A, a market was free for the uh, creditor class to take over, a, a market for the, the monopolists to take over, uh, to get rid of anti-monopoly legislation, uh, a, a market free for bankers to uh, create credit for whatever they wanted to, but uh, not for uh, the public. And a market where it was free for politicians and uh, billionaires to take over and have the government sell off the, the public railroads, uh, sell off uh, the public domain, uh, sell off uh, uh, the land, sell off everything and privatize it, uh, and uh, do what Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan did, uh, and uh, impose neoliberalism. And neoliberalism in the United States was simply the old uh, uh, Roman uh, uh, oligarchy that led to the decline and fall, which is why the decline and fall of Rome is so much like uh, the decline and fall of uh, the United States today. Well, uh, it's, it's too late to save uh, the US and European economies the way they are. The, the whole, uh, since 1945, uh, you had the world uh, emerge from the war without, uh, any, without private debt at all because there was very little to borrow for to buy in World War II. All since 1945, there's been a vast run-up of debt that is now so large that uh, mo most Americans, half of Americans don't have any savings at all. Uh, they are, they're broke. Uh, they are in debt. Of, uh, if they go to school, they have student debt. If you buy a house, you go into mortgage debt. Uh, you need a credit card debt to get by. Uh, the economy is, uh, is in a debt deflation and is being impoverished in the same way uh, that Rome was. And uh, this, uh, when uh, Asian students are sent to the United States, it's as if you think of the West as a force of nature. You think, well, what's happened in West is the future. What's happened in West is what's natural. Well, it's not natural at all. The natural fight is what China's doing and saying, we're not going to go down the road that led Rome to collapse and has led the United States and Europe to collapse. We're picking up where civilization left off 2000 years ago. We're picking up the whole line of civilization again. So this, uh, the, the Americans are fighting against this and they have a slogan for fighting against uh, China. And their slogan is the end of history. Uh, history is uh, gone as far as it can. What does it mean for history to end? It means there isn't going to be any reform. There isn't going to be any change. Leave things just as they are with us in power, with us uh, 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 creating our dollars. And you have to use our dollars. You have to uh, conduct your trade in dollars uh, so that we can grab them. If you do something we don't like, then uh, and you hold all of your savings in dollars, we can grab them. Like we've just grabbed all of Russia's dollars in the West all of Russia's gold in the West. We've grabbed all of Venezuela's gold. Uh, and we want you to, to do that. That is the end of history. And uh, we don't want history to go forward because uh, that would be a uh, move away from a unipolar economy to a multipolar uh, economy. And the end of history means you, uh, now that we have privatization and financialization uh, and a, a shift of government planning away from the political center, to the economic and financial center, that's uh, the, end, the end of history. This is perfection, we can't go anymore. Well, the irony is that uh, in the last year, you've seen President Biden and American diplomacy help ex drive other countries away from all of this. Uh, they've been uh, saying, they've been putting the sanctions on uh, uh, every uh, vital uh, computer opponents and things that uh, China needs. They've been uh, blocking uh, Russia from, uh, from food. They've forced uh, Russia, China, India, uh, Indonesia, they forced other countries to go their own way and to become independent so that America can't say, 
uh, if you don't uh, uh, do what we want, we will stop uh, exporting food to you and you'll starve like we tried to char starve China in the 1950s after Mao's revolution. Uh, we will try to disrupt your economy uh, and we'll grab your dollars. Well, China, Russia, and other countries are de-dollarizing and saying, well, okay, we see that that's what you're threatening to do. We're going to protect ourselves from your threat. We're going to denominate our trade and our investment and our savings in our own currencies uh, with our, our own bank independently uh, of yours. That's how, why the world is dividing uh, in, in, uh, in two uh, parts right now. So uh, the end of history uh, uh, turned out to be very short lived. Uh, it, was, it was a dream, and, uh, but the United States still thinks that it can uh, impose this uh, somehow. And uh, the end of history is what that meant was there is no alternative. This is the end of history. Well, there is an alternative. And uh, that's what uh, China and uh, other countries are trying to do. And if you look over the whole sweep of ancient history, you can see that the alternative was to create a, a society with a strong enough government to use, uh, uh, create money and credit to finance its own growth uh, of production uh, and living standards, uh, to finance uh, itself uh, not uh, uh, create a, uh, an oligarchy. Uh, and today uh, you, you have China, India, Iran, and other uh, uh, Eurasian economies taking the first step is a precondition for a, a multipolar world by rejecting America's insistence that they join uh, the United States uh, trade and financial uh, sanctions against Russia. Uh, it, there was just a big meeting in uh, uh, in, uh, I think, uh, uh, Indonesia, where the United States asked China to join against Russia. And you can, you can imagine what the Chinese delegates said. Well, you want to destroy Russia so that after you destroy it, now you can do the same thing to us. Uh, you think we're crazy? And uh, uh, all that the United States can do is what uh, Rome did 2,000 years ago. It says, well, there's one way to end history. We can atom bomb you all. Uh, and uh, if you think we're kidding, we're going to make sure that the presidents we elect are crazy. So you don't know what a crazy person will, doing, will do. This was the policy that President Nixon uh, developed in the 1970s. Uh, uh, he said, uh, I've appointed crazy people in charge of the military. So if you don't do what we want, we're just crazy enough to blow up the whole world. Well, uh, in Russia, President uh, you know, uh, President Putin had a response. Uh, he said, well, who wants to live in a world without Russia? Uh, we can blow up the world too. So that's the, uh, uh, the point at which uh, we've, we've reached. Uh, the question is whether history will be determined uh, militarily or by uh, uh, economically. And uh, the, uh, if it's economic, the United States can only maintain the prosperity of its billionaires by extracting wealth from other countries. Uh, America got rich off the trade of China, off the American, the American companies by moving their labor to China, impoverished the labor force. They, it, they created a rust built in America. The factories are all rusty. They've been turned into luxury housing for financial managers, uh, but there's no industry here. Well, uh, the, the whole idea is that uh, the, the America without industry can somehow live by exploiting other countries, but how are you going to get other countries to go along with it? That's where uh, China is taking the lead. And uh, for the first time, other countries have uh, an, enough economic output that they don't need the United States. They can go it alone. They can be, uh, depend on each other, conduct their trade on each other, and uh, basically, uh, uh, survive. And that is uh, what is the hope for you is the nightmare for uh, the United States, because the Chinese socialist policy is in many ways a return to the whole idea of resilience that characterized most civilizations before Greece and Rome broke away. Uh, and uh, China is taking the lead and taking a state strong enough to uh, resist the emergence of a financial oligarchy gaining control.
Of course you have billionaires there. At least your billionaires have become that way by being innovative and making uh, 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 high, high productivity. But uh, at a certain point, they are expected to use their billions to uh, develop uh, China as a whole. That's China's internal uh, fight uh, politics right now. Uh, but the oligarchic drive that has polarized and destroyed the economies of Greece and Rome and the United States uh, is, should be a model of what China and uh, other countries need to avoid as you go forward. Thank you. Well, many thanks, uh, Michael Hudson. Uh, it's really rich, deep, and uh, during your uh, speech also, I believe uh, from the audience, uh, there are already many points, questions, and uh, they like to discuss with us, with you. Uh, but before I like to first introduce our Actually, uh, yeah, originally there were two, but now seems we have only one available tonight uh, as uh, the discussant, who is Ranhika uh, Desai. She's a professor at the Department of Political Studies, University of Manitoba, uh, Canada. She is also the author of, uh, again, many books, including the geopolitical economy after US hegemon, globalization and empire. And also from the Congress to Hindu, Hinduta in Indian politics, intellectuals and socialism. Social Democrats at the Labour Party. And she's also an editor for many books or co-edited many books with others, including the Future of Capitalism. Uh, it's a book series. And also she serves on the editorial board for for instance, Canadian Political Science Review, Critique of Political Economy, E-Social Sciences, Pacific Affairs, etc., etc. So I'd like to first invite her to give her comments and responses to Professor Michael Hudson's uh, lecture tonight before inviting questions from the audience. It's always a great pleasure and very refreshing to listen to Michael and his very, very broad sweep of the his economic history of the world, which I think is always, um, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's particularly at this time worth paying attention to. Um, I feel that what Michael has said really sheds a lot of light on where we are today in the major capitalist countries and particularly in what i've been what i've been calling the the leading neoliberal financialized economy such as the united states and the united kingdom in particular because of course there are many different types of capitalism and i'll come to that in a couple of minutes but in these societies in particular we are seeing astronomical levels of inequality um, abject failure, in fact, not abject, murderous and shambolic failure to deal with COVID. The initiation of a war that absolutely makes no sense, the proxy war against Russia, which is being conducted over Ukraine, it is shameful to an extent that is not imaginable because on the one hand, the West talks about standing up for Ukraine. On the other hand, the West is demanding the ongoing destruction of that country, of their economy, of their people, of their society. So it is, it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's mind boggling. The productive debility of these economies, which, be, which was already be, beginning to be apparent 
uh, particularly after 2008, but it goes back a long way. It goes basically back to the beginnings of neoliberalism. Going back all of that way, the productive debility of these societies is clear. And of course, now, all after four decades of neoliberalism, we have had the, the compounding of the failures, the increasing debility of these societies has given rise to dissent, except, except that after four decades during which the, in fact, more, longer, for, for nearly a century during which the left has been pilloried, especially after the uh, of, uh, Bolshevik revolution and everything that has happened since, the marginalization of the left has meant that the dissent takes the form of the election to high office of charlatans like Trump and Johnson. And the only alternative we have are those people like Biden and others who create the conditions for the likes of Trump and Johnson to be to emerge and be elected. So really, if you think about it, these societies in the West are at a very sorry pass. And Michael has put his finger on it. What's wrong in this picture that we are looking at? Obviously, at one level, of course, what's wrong is capitalism. But even within that, things have gone badly off script. Because if you think about it, as Marx put it, and I still feel that Marx offers the best theoretical uh, a framework for understanding what has happened. As Marx put it, these societies have gone from the, 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 the circuit of capital, which is ideally, which is beginning with money, buy commodities, put them into production, get commodities of higher value and sell them, M, C, C dash, M dash. Except these societies have given up even on that, despite the fact that there are huge profits to be made, despite the fact that there is huge exploitation to profit from. They have short circuited this process. They want to go straight from M to M dash without any intervening production. How do you do that? You do that by squeezing everybody else who produces. That means working people. That means more productive economies elsewhere. So you try to squeeze China. And by the way, it also involves squeezing the more productive capitalist economies of which Japan and Germany are good examples. And it is not without reason that the current war over Ukraine involves the US demanding that the German economy strangle itself into nothingness that it give up its sole sources of energy in order to uh, essentially pursue the US's mad war against Russia. And why, by the way, is it conducting the mad war against Russia and the new Cold War against China? Because Russia and China are in the forefront, or should I say China and Russia are in the forefront of those economies that refuse to be so exploited. And therefore, they are saying so. So that's broadly the picture we are looking at. And I would say that basically, if you take what Michael is saying and what I'm about to say seriously, you will realize that People in the world today, and particularly in the neoliberal financialized capitalist countries, are paying the price of keeping their societies capitalist, which is simply another way of saying it's high time we move to socialism. But let me now say, how did we get here? What did Marx, ex Marx expect and what really happened? Well, what Marx expected at one level is very simple. Marx said, look, Capitalism has a historic, capitalism has a historic vocation. Its historic vocation is to socialize labor, you know, to essentially in, make increasingly complex productive organization possible. And capitalism initially does that in the competitive phase of capitalism. It did that by socializing labor among firms. And then it enters its monopoly phase where the firms themselves become giant authoritative organizations of labor within firms. And once that moment comes to pass, if you read Capital, particularly volume three, particularly I think chapter 27, 
I think it's 27 or 25. But anyway, you read that. What is becomes very clear is that Marx expected that at this point, capitalism had done its job. It didn't do the job very, very well. You know, capitalism may socialize labor, but it does it brutally. It does it exploitatively. It does it chaotically. But OK, it did that. Now, whatever historical vocation it may have had, it's finished. So in that sense, the major writers of the uh, turn of the century, the last century, that is the early 20th century, who basically said that, you know, we are now living at the highest stage of capitalism. There is nothing to go beyond here than socialism. I think they were right. And by the way, many people like Keynes, like Polanyi, like even many US policymakers at the end of the Second World War feared precisely that we would be looking at a transition to socialism unless the United States organized a rear guard action. And that's what the United States has been doing since that time. Okay, so that's why first point I want to make is that that's what Marx expected. And by the way, on the matter, the critically important matter, which has gone badly wrong in our time, which is the relation between finance and industry, Marx also expected, very, that Marx was very clear. Marx said, look, as uh, Michael has, uh, without the benefit of Michael's uh, uh, amazing research, Marx was still able to say that the financial system that capitalism inherits from the past, namely the, from feudal times, is an archaic financial system. It is not interested in production. It is simply interested in sucking off the fruits of whatever production other people may manage to organize. This financial system cannot exist side by side with capitalism. It exists for a while, but then it must give way to a more sophisticated financial system whose purpose is to expand capitalist production. And this is where my work, and I should say that my uh, work on um, <clears throat> what I'm saying today refers to this manifesto, which I'm just sharing the link to. And it also refers to my book, Geopolitical Economy, which Professor Ping uh, mentioned. And I have uh, another book coming out later this year, which is entitled Capitalism, Coronavirus and War, a Geopolitical Economy, which also covers some of the same ground. So essentially, Marx expected this would happen. And indeed, in a certain sense, it did happen. Because if you take into account the fact that capitalism does not develop fully in any one place. It, it, it engages in uneven and combined development so that its development takes spatial leaps. So it developed its, in its competitive form, its first industrial revolution form in Britain, and then the second industrial revolution from the monopoly form developed most fully in those countries, such as Germany, such as the United States, such as Japan, which were challengers to Britain's supremacy. So that's where they developed first. And Hilferding pointed out that there also you found a new type of finance, finance devoted to financing production rather than sucking off from production as you had in Britain. So in fact, when you read finance capital, Hilferding contrasts the financial system, which is very conducive to productive expansion that exists particularly in Germany because Hilferding focused on that, it was the case he knew best. And the British financial system, which he thought was archaic, it was short term, it did not provide long term large amounts of capital for big projects as monopoly capital needed, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So he clearly contrasted these. And the British financial system was already under pressure. And Hilferding already noted that in the early 20th century, it was coming under pressure to become more like the continental system, the German system. But the First World War intervened. And even in the course of the First World War, if Keynes had had his way, Thatcher's financial system would have ended. But of course, Keynes didn't get his way. And the reason for that, the and there is so much to say, I'm just going to give the highlights and then we can discuss. But the key reason was that by the time you got to the First World War, American policymaking elites could already see that Britain's imperial hold on the world economy was weakening and they wanted to replace that with their own the, uh, 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 dominance over the world economy so in a certain sense they wanted to replace the sterling system with a dollar system it didn't go very well you know the first uh, 30 years after the second world war the dollar went from crisis to crisis and in the end the gold link had to be broken it's only after that, after 1971, as Michael and I have argued in one of our papers called Beyond Dollar Creditocracy, it's only after that 
that the American financial system, which had previously resembled the more productive type, began to be rapidly transformed in a series of deregulative measures into something more like the archaic financial system of Britain, which had sustained the sterling's uh, 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 role, and now the Br American system sustains the dollar's world role. And it acts as, I think it was Yanis Varoufakis who said, it acts like a giant, or no, it was an article in Wired magazine that says giant vampire squid sucking a value from all over the world into the US system. So that's essentially the unproductive type of capitalism that we have. And, and, and the, the key has been, so, so, so essentially what I'm trying to say is that in, in some sense, the world was ready for a transition to socialism already in the early 20th century. And what we have seen and to some extent this happened in the, in immediately after the Second World War, you had actually existing socialism. You had Keynesian welfare states in first world countries, which were based on much very productive form of capitalism, Fordism, etc. And finally, you had third world countries trying to pursue autonomous national development, distinctly leaning leftward, distinctly leaning in a socialistic direction in many countries. So now this is what you had. But underlying the underlying system in capitalist in in the major capitalist countries remain capitalist and inevitably it ran into crisis by the 1970s and at that point the the systems that were created which by the way had also tamed finance with capital controls with ca capital account regulation etc the you know the the argument was made that the problem was that all these controls on economic activity were the problem whereas in fact it was the underlying capitalist character of these economies that was the problem so the west stood at, at the crossroads of two options one to deepen the socialistic reforms that had made for a golden age of capitalism in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, by providing the basis of demand, by regulating capital and making sure that the uh, uh, you know that that wages did not suffer at the expense of profits or not as much, et cetera, et cetera. All of the you can you could deepen those reforms, or you could say those reforms were the problem, roll them back, give freedom to capital and expect that there would be some kind of major capitalist renaissance. Well, we have seen a made, the only type of capitalist renaissance that's possible, and that is a renaissance of financialized capitalism sitting on top of a small number of big corporations that make money again via monopoly. So this is the type of capitalism that we have in Western countries today, and it's no good. And I should also add a couple of other things here. One thing is that I said I referred earlier to the leading neoliberal financialized capitalist countries. These are to be contrasted with Japan and Germany, for example. But, but it's also very clear that Japan and Germany's desire to remain capitalist is actually mortgaging the productive economy to the well, to finance capital basically you ca cannot have the two so their dilemma is as follows if they try to retain their productive structure they will be pulled in the direction of socialism if they don't retain their productive structure they will be pulled in the direction of neoliberal financialized capitalism this is not a very good choice and in if i was a citizen of these countries the choice would be very clear the difficulty is that the people who hold power in these societies, the capitalists, are going to be loath to make these choices. And I just want to end by talking about one final thing that I really think is very important. Sorry, it's my dog. I can't help that. He's just barking. Um, okay, so the a final point I'd like to make is this. I think it's critically important for us to understand, and this has been a th the thrust of much of my own writing as well, it's critically important for us to understand that neoclassical economics, which is on which neoliberalism rests, neoclassical economics has to be removed from all curricula in China, in Western countries, etc., because it, it, it has a completely wrong conception of um, it has the completely wrong conception of how an economy functions. And the key to that is something that Michael already identified and I will underline. It has erased the concept of rentier. 
the concept of making money without producing from the curriculum. So basically, neoclassical economics considers rent, monopoly rent, uh, uh, and of course, interest and, and, and financial activity as though they were productive activities, whereas classical political economy and the critics of classical political economy, such as Keynes, etc., knew very well that you cannot you know, that that rentier uh, 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 activities are uh, are a problem so so uh, uh, i think maybe i will end there there's so much so many more things to say I, um, michael referred to whether you can settle things by force alone and i can only refer to engels and his wonderful reflections on the role of force in history you cannot have force alone you force can has to be backed by the capacity to produce so uh with the with that i will end here and uh, look forward to the discussion thank you many thanks professor desai again another really uh, insightful and intellectually uh, well uh, organized uh, responses to Michael's speech and uh, you also gave us a uh, uh, deep uh, think now how this uh, more than current but the capitalist system also uh, uh, driven by this new liberal economics uh, how this actually fundamentally gone wrong um, before we go to uh, or invite more discussions, questions, uh, I also like to share some of my uh, concerns after listening to actually both of you. One, even I fully agree with you both, but still uh, as a sort of classically we say, or even typically things come up, uh, the main problem is between capital and the labor. But from you, your speech tonight, also from your previous writing publications, you focus on the current main problem that is between finance capitals, industry capitals. This is something we really need to uh, be more clear and uh, understand why and how this uh, US uh, domination of this finance capitalism, which is on the one side the source of the crisis, on the other side uh, is uh, also the source of the problems, including even existing or possibly more wars. So, this uh, I like to both of you, to, to listen to both of you a little bit further. Second, even you focus more on this, uh, say, economic dimension, including finance. Uh, but if, as capitalist system as a whole, uh, there are such dimensions from eco economic, financial, to political, uh, legal, and social military and finally ideological. So as a system, how they make kind of dominance also have the crisis even now is uh, in a process of the collapse of this. So how you see either they fight each other, for instance, you have mentioned there's a problem between Washington and New York. Uh, or they help one another. For instance, when there are economic crises, might be even the very reason to launch wars against others in order to, to transfer their own problem to others. And ideologically, even in spite of all the problems since the early Period with the capitalists to, for instance, the new liberal economy and so on. In spite of all the problems, failures, uh, so they still had or oh, claim the other sort of uh, legitimized hegemony. Therefore, they should be the ruler of the world. 
So these two main questions I like to also listen to you. Both of you, maybe you can go a little bit further. Then we invite. I saw already lots of uh, questions. Uh, would like to people like to discuss with or listen to. Well, my earlier uh, lectures uh, for this group on the uh, uh, on the destiny of civilization was all about the, the transition from finance capitalism to industrial capitalism. Mm. There's no fight anymore. Finance has taken over. American industrial corporations are run by financial managers, not by, not by industrial managers. Money's made by financial engineering, not by industrial engineering. Uh, if you are a, uh, look at the reason that we're having an oil uh, shortage problem in uh, the world right now. Uh, if you're an oil company, you can do two things. Uh, you're making a lot of profits on your oil, now, either you can use these profits to uh, drill more oil wells and increase production, or you can buy your own stock and just pay them all out as dividends. Well, if, if you're a financial manager, uh, you're paid by how much you push up the stock price. So you don't invest. Invest is long term. Uh, finance lives in the short term. They're going to use their profits to buy up their own stock, to push up the price, and to pay dividends so that other people will say they can make money by buying the stock. Money is made financially, not by industrial investment anymore. So already uh, the finance capitalism has re replaced uh, it, uh, industrial capitalism. People, industrial capitalism was seeming to be in, evolving into socialism in the 19th century until World War I, but that's not what happened. It didn't evolve in, into socialism. It evolved into finance capitalism, and socialism can only come from rejecting this whole dynamic of, uh, uh, of evolution of capitalism into a financial form. So just as uh, in antiquity, the uh, democracy evolved into, aristoc into oligarchy and aristocracy, industrial capitalism involved into finance capitalism, and uh, now uh, the uh, uh, feudal, <laughs> neo-feudalism, we're going back. We've rolled back the whole prog progress are, and are uh, reverting to the whole spirit of Western civilization, which is feudalism and impoverishment and debt bondage. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I'd like to add a couple of things, both to the questions that Professor Ping put and also to a couple of the comments, particularly from my editor of my latest book, Barry Gill. So I'd like to, uh, yes, yes. to, uh, to, to respond to that uh, very quickly. So number one, uh, I think that, uh, you know, you pointed out, Professor Ping, that um, uh, we, uh, whereas, you know, in classical Marxism, we think of capitalism as um, involving um, capital and labor, uh, uh, now we, Michael and I are talking about a slightly different matter, which is the relation between industrial and financial capital, and you're absolutely right. But I would like to uh, dwell a little bit more on that. Number one, I would say that Marx never discounted the role of landlords and other forms of rentier income for him. He analyzed that and he also understood the possibility of um, the, uh, I mean, in that sense, he did take a lot of leaves out of Ricardo's book. Ricardo viscerally hated Rontier uh, uh, capital and, and, and so also uh, 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 Marx took that on. Um, so, so that, that, that's, and, and, and Marx only, if Marx perhaps de-emphasized the possibility that has actually materialized of the do dominance of financialized accumulation, MM dash form of accumulation, it's because he expected that actually over the course of its development, capitalism would take this old form of usurious capital and subordinate it to its own requirements, changing it into a form of banking, which would serve capitalist accumulation by providing long-term finance, patient capital that was capable of expanding 
productive, like the kind of financial system that we had before the, uh, the current financialization in most Western countries, the kind of financial system we still have in countries like China and so on. So that's my first point. The second point is that in the course of this, what has happened in Western countries, of course, is that as far as working people are concerned, they are not just exploited as workers, but they are also squeezed as debtors. This is the key thing. More and more people are not just employed. You know, it's not just a question of employment that faces workers. It's also the question of debt. The overwhelming majority of households are indebted. And that's that's one of the key relationships that we have to uh, also bear in mind. And I also want to say one other thing, which is that and this joins up with some, this, your second point, which was about hegemony. I've argued in geopolitical economy, and I've sustained this argument in my newest book as well, uh, Cap uh, uh, Capitalism, Coronavirus and War, A Geopolitical Economy. And that is very simply that the idea of hegemony is bonkers. Oh. And it emerges entirely from the ambitions of American policymakers and businessmen in the early 20th century, to repeat what they think Britain had accomplished in the previous century, which is that Britain had somehow managed to, to rule over the whole world by imposing, particularly by imposing sterling on the rest of the world. Now, the problem with that is that already that, that had at least two sources of instability. Number one, the increasing organization of the working class at home, which would make the kind of discipline required by the gold standard impossible. And number two, the challenge of the contender powers like Germany, like uh, United States and other countries, but particularly in this case, Germany, which was already destabilizing the sterling system. If you, mm. there are many sources that show this. So the you know and plus the United States forgot one other thing. The only reason the British could run the sterling system is because they sat on top of a vast empire. And the surpluses of this empire, particularly British India, which was the largest chunk of that empire and among the most exploited, they drew surpluses from British India and uh, 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 exported it as capital exports to the rest of the world and not in some generic sense, but particularly to white settler colonies, to the United States and to Europe. So in that sense, the second industrial revolution, industrialization was critically financed by these sorts of capital exports on the UK's part in particular. Yeah. So, so, but without such an empire, you cannot have dollar hegemony and the Americans have never properly succeeded. Before 1971, they did not succeed. They clearly failed because within a few years of other currencies become, becoming convertible, the United States already didn't have enough gold to back it. Okay. And after breaking the gold backing, US, the US dollar's world role has rested, as Michael and I have argued in our paper, Beyond Dollar Creditocracy, on a series of financializations. That is to say, the blowing up of asset bubbles, which brings dollars into the US, thereby counteracting the downward pressure which American deficits put on the dollar. So this is this is what it's been. So he hegemony is really a, I, uh, it is a ambition of the United States dressed up in theoretical drag, theoretical clothes by uh, important uh, exponents of uh, American interests, such as Charles Kindleberger, and then following them, a whole lot of other people. So hegemony is, in fact, we, if you look at the historical development of capitalism, you don't see hegemony. What you see is increasing multipolarity, or what I would now call pluripolarity. That is the increasing spread of productive power, which makes the domination of any single power impossible. What we are witnessing right now is the United States uh, attempts to hang on by with his fingernails on what remains of its power. Very quickly, one other thing, uh, the productive, two other things, productive debility of the United States in the case, in the present situation, they don't actually have, they are unable to manufacture the weapons that they need to send to Ukraine. That's why the weapons supply. So the manufacturing debility is showing up even in the core sector, which the United States has kept alive through massive subsidies. And one final point, because I know for Barry, this is a subject of huge, 
huge discussions. But I would just say one thing. Of course, I'm completely an environmentalist. I think that we have to stop climate change. We have to stop pollution. We have to stop biodiversity being declining, etc. These are existential challenges for all of us on this planet. I totally agree. I just want to say that sometimes this is articulated as degrowth. But if you look at it, Precisely in those decades when world growth actually slowed down, particularly in Western countries, growth slowed down. These are the decades during which every indicator of environmental destruction has been climbing steeply so that it's not so much growth, it's the kind of growth we have. And we can have growth, that is to say, a betterment of the human condition, including material betterment by a better pattern of growth with more shared resources with more uh, 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 with a more socialistic pattern of growth i think we can we can uh, pursue that as well so mm -hmm. sorry to go on for a long time but yeah um, okay, I, I thought i would say those things thank you so much both i have uh, a third question which uh, i can uh, ask now but you don't don't need to answer me now, maybe before we listen, uh, after we listen to others. But my third question is, do you think both the next immediate crisis will be the crisis from within in the US, for instance, the slower or even less growth and the high inflation, etc., mainly in the domestic problem? or the problem between US and others, especially China. So this is a sort of third uh, question I have had in mind. But now I like to, perhaps should, I should invite, I already saw some questions. Let me invite some of the questions. Uh, one, I saw someone has repeat this question twice. One, yes, for, Professor Hudson, how did the World War One? How did the World War One stop the progress of taxing the land rent? How did the democratization of the property ownership financialize the real estate in the twentieth century? This is a question for. Michael. I've described yes. that uh, in my book, uh, Killing the Host. Uh, England uh, had taken the lead in trying to get rid of the landlord class because it had the most vicious, worst, and stupidest landlord class uh, 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 in the West. And by 1909, finally, uh, the uh, uh, democratic reform, uh, industrial capitalism, uh, realized that in order to make uh, capitalism in England competitive, you had to remove the House of Lords from making British policy. And so it was industrial capitalism that urged democracy and uh, to shift uh, political power to the House of Commons, away from the House of Lords, uh, because uh, that way you could stop the House of Lords from saying, don't tax the land, give us the power. Well, finally, the House of Commons passed the Revenue Act that was going to be uh, uh, to tax the land. Well, the House of Lords then said, ha ha, we have the same power that the Roman Senate can, had. Uh, the democracy government can propose laws, but we get to veto them. And whoever has the veto power gets to control and we can beat, the House of Lords vetoed it. There was a constitutional crisis in uh, England and uh, they passed, uh, they changed the constitution so that the uh, House of Lords could never again uh, veto a revenue bill put out by the House of Commons. Well, by that, all, by that time, England had decided uh, we, don't, we, want, we don't want to uh, any other country to rival our industry. Let's go to war with Germany. They immediately prepared their war for Germany uh, uh, against uh, Germany. And uh, the uh, very soon, they uh, brought on uh, World War I. And by the time they uh, uh, emerged from the World War I, the story that I've described in super imperialism, uh, England, uh, America, England 
uh, agreed to pay its war debts to the United States for the arms that England bought to fight Germany before uh, America entered the war. And that uh, bankrupted England. And it's, but so much that then England and the Allies said, well, we'll make Germany pay reparations. Uh, the whole, uh, it was World War I, the change shifted the whole center of world power away from England and the empire to the United States. And in the United States, there had been a revolution in economic thought. Uh, the anti-classical economists, uh, people like uh, John Bates Clark, said there's no such thing as economic rent. The landlord uh, provides a protect productive act. All this rent that the landlord gets, he deserves by deciding who to rent the land to. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, GDP statistics in the United States today, uh, most of the American GDP takes the form of landlord rent and Wall Street interest. Uh, uh, the Wall Street is uh, considered to be productive by charging interest and most banks and credit card companies make more money on penalties and low late fees for credit cards than they make on, for, uh, on interest. And all of this is contribute to GDP because they say charging late fees is the, uh, the productive activity of banks is deciding who to lend money to, to extract the late fees uh, uh, from. So we had a whole uh, revolution in the concept of uh, how economies get rich uh, and stemming from the United States, the idea was that economies get rich by finance, not by industry. Uh, and the, uh, once you got rid of the landlord class uh, and democratized home ownership and property ownership, how is somebody going to buy a house? Well, nobody had enough money to go and buy a house. You buy it on mortgage. So uh, as democratization of land meant that families could, uh, everybody could buy a house by taking a mortgage and the land rent that used to be paid to the landlord was now paid to the banks as mortgage interest. And all of a sudden the banks replaced the landlord class uh, and uh, essentially ended up as the main rentier uh, interest, that is the main rent recipient interest or rent extracting interest. So uh, you had finance replace the landlords and finance also became the mother of trusts, the mother of monopolies. Finance would, uh, the Wall Street would buy uh, all of the copper companies and merge them together, take all of the oil companies, merge them together, uh, all of the steel companies merge them into the steel trust, make a monopoly, and take their uh, their return not as a profits but as super rents, as monopoly rents so over and above. So we had a, a rentier uh, economy replacing the uh, idealized uh, industrial economy after World War One. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. After listening to this, to your this uh, response so uh, answering the question. Maybe I should uh, change a little bit of my third question. Instead of either or, which one is more serious and more immediate? Maybe I should ask like this. Do you think the US key problem, even only from economic and financial point of view, is that on the one hand, the bubble is uh, and will always be here in the US on the one hand, and on the other hand, the so-called reindustrialization will be actually impossible. And do you think that actually oh, is yeah. or can be? Yes, yes, please. Uh, you're treating deindustrialization as a problem. You're treating oh. poverty as a problem. Poverty oh. is a solution. The industrialization is the solution. Why do you yeah. think it's a problem? If you're a billionaire, it's not a problem. You're getting rich with the industrialization. <laughs> so what is the problem to you is the solution to the uh, the oligarchy. Uh, uh, now, you, it may be a solution with internal contradictions, uh, but it's still uh, the poverty and the bubble is the solution of the wealthy class to use the financial system not to support public spending into the economy, 
to rebuild the infrastructure, but simply to buy stocks and bonds, and especially uh, junk junk bonds, junk, uh, yes. package mortgages, so that mm -hmm. the uh, the 1%, the 10% of the wealthiest Americans mm -hmm. that own 72% of the stock yes. and most of the bonds won't lose money on their investments, or at least they mm -hmm. can now sell out and uh, uh, sell out the stock, sell out the bonds, and begin buying up the land. So you have the uh, the former head of uh, uh, the computer co uh, awful computer company. Uh, uh, I'm blocking out the name. Uh, the, the becoming the wealthiest uh, uh, land landholder or the largest landholder in the United States. The uh, the financial class is bailing out. They're buying uh, real estate. And uh, since uh, President Obama's uh, support of the uh, uh, the junk mortgage crisis uh, and the massive eviction of millions of American families, uh, home ownership in the United States is now gone down from uh, 69% to 61%, and it's plunging rapidly because the the stockhold, the financial class is now saying the financial game's over. Uh, we've made the problem. We've sold our stocks and bonds to the Federal Reserve. Now let's yes. begin buying up uh, all the houses for sale and uh, turn America away from a right. owner-occupied uh, housing into rental housing. The financial right. class is now reverted and is making itself back into the old-fashioned landlord class uh, mm -hmm. in the United States. Rents are soaring here. Now that's impoverishing the people. If you have right. to pay more in rent and more in debt, yes. you're not going to have uh, uh, enough money to buy the goods and services you don't produce. Uh, but America is not producing goods and services. So that doesn't matter. If you can't afford to buy goods and services, that means you can't buy Chinese imports so much, but you, you, you can pay the, uh, uh, the new landlords of the house you're renting. You can pay uh, your bankers and you can pay the finance, insurance, and real estate sector, the fire sector. That's what the modern American economy is, the fire sector, not the industrial sector. I mean, I think, uh, Michael, your, your comments are excellent as a sort of ironic statement, but we also have to look at the real effects. I mean, if you consider the following, then I think it becomes possible to understand what's really happening, particularly in the United States and the UK at this point, yes. because you were asking about whether these economies and these countries will oh. somehow implode or will they be destroyed by their confrontation with China? Well, I think the signs of implosion have been mounting for a very long time, because if you think about it, the only the, the key political relationship that stabilized the relationship between capitalism and working people in the post Second World War period was the social contract that underlay the Keynesian welfare states, etc. There was some kind of a moderation in the level of capitalist exploitation and plunder, et cetera, and expansion of working class wages and demand. Uh, and, and these things made a material difference. And what neoliberalism meant was a reversal of this. Uh, and since the onset of neoliberalism, we have had increasing concern about the quality of liberal democracy. Because on the one hand, the West goes to wars by waving the flag of democracy and human rights, whereas, of course, the reversal of the social contract, the adoption of neoliberal policies, financialization, deindustrialization, right. all of these things have been all excoriating democracy from within. People are writing books with titles such as, in fact, I think Barry was one of them. He early on, uh, he edited a book called Low Intensity Democracy. But more recently, for example, there is a very good book called The Hollowing Out of Western Democracies, which shows that, you know, the, that, that the old idea that democracy somehow links leaders and, and people, yeah, 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 people. It's, it's gone. There is no linkage no, anymore. No, and, no and, more. and so what you get are these populist, uh, so, so essentially both parties, like, you know, essentially right-wing parties move further to the right and left-wing parties, instead of challenging them by moving to the left, also move to the right. Oh, so the yes, entire yes. political spectrum has yes, moved yes. to the right. Mm -hmm. And in this context, ordinary people and their concerns have no representation. So what that does is it allows charlatans like Trump to be elected, like Johnson to be elected. Mm -hmm. Trump made a whole big deal about free trade and how he was going to oppose it and so on. Johnson, on you know, he, he attacked Brexit, whereas in fact, 
Britain, the, what ails the British people was not so much the relation with the EU, where the British always had a, you know, a pick and choose approach, you know, we will buy into this and not buy into that. So Britain's problems were more or less completely homegrown. Hmm. It's not part of the Eurozone. It's not part of the social chapter. All of these things is a homegrown problem. But they, he managed to blame the EU, which also has a lot of problems, but nevertheless, and he got elected. Now look at what has happened to him. I mean, a, a complete charlatan who has not a, there is not a principal bone in his body and he is now gone. But look at the ro rogues gallery that has yeah, gathered yeah. to succeed him. They are just as bad. So in this context, you are already seeing just today in the Financial Times, I'm reading that the possibility that the Roe versus Wade and other restrictions on the powers of the federal government in the United States may very well presage the disintegration of the United States. There are many deep fault lines in the United States. Wow. The old Civil War fault line is one of them. In the UK, you already have the possibility, the, the Brexit referendum has already brought forward the possibility of the unification of Ireland and uh, uh, the reunification of Ireland. And it has brought forward the possibility of um, the secession of Scotland. So that means, and, and if, if these two countries are gone, what does it, where does that leave England and Wales? And who is, what are the, the Labour Party under Keir Starmer is, has not a chance in hell of addressing the genuine concerns of ordinary people. So you're back to the age of the Jacquerie. You know, people, mm -hmm. people have no yes. choice but to protest in an oh, incohate way because there is not a single political force. So if in this situation, you are actually sitting on tinder boxes, mm -hmm. both in a social sense and in the national sense that I described earlier, that there are many nations embedded within these two neoliberal financialized countries. So the possibility of implosion is definitely there. And I haven't even mm -hmm. said a single thing about the confrontation with China where the Americans are losing the technological war, the trade war, the currency war, and increasingly <laughs> the weapons technology war. So what more do we need to say? Hmm. Yes, thank you. I saw one of the questions here, maybe not the first, but uh, the question uh, goes like this question. Professor Desai, as well as Professor Hudson, what if China becomes a new land lord, money or money lord of the world in the future? Is there a way or any way to prevent that? Isn't getting free lunch everybody's, everybody's dream becoming a, a parasite? Basically, is human civilization stormed to fight the same war again and again? This is the question. Then one of the greatest dangers to the people of the world in present period in the problem of how to deal with a US in a serious decline, i.e. how to limit the damage it may attempt to inflict externally as it desperately seeks to defeat, defend its power position while internally being in ever deeper social, economic, and political crisis. Please comment on the Actually, significant, are... significance of the rise of the left movement and the parties in Latin America? That's, that's the question, long question. Yeah, thank you. Well, anyway. in, breaking away, in breaking away from the United States, in creating a multipolar world order, uh, it is necessary to create a okay. whole uh, alternative set of institutions that will include an international bank, not like the International Monetary Fund mm -hmm. is an arm of the US, but as a, a mutual bank. Uh, and uh, this bank uh, will arrange payments among different countries to be made in their own currencies. Uh, and there's a basic principle that no, uh, of international finance uh, 
uh, and internet that should be an international law. No country should be obliged to impoverish itself in order to pay foreign bondholders. That means no country should have to impose, take the IMF advice to I'm create nice. austerity, yes. to fight the labor unions, uh, simply in order to pay uh, the dollar uh, bondholder. Now, in creating uh, th this uh, crisis is, that will create this institution will probably arise uh, this summer, because as uh, oil prices go up and as food prices go up, uh, the global south, Latin America and Africa, will have a choice. Uh, they're going to have to pay uh, much more for their food, for their energy. Uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to starve or will they say, we're we can't afford to buy food. Uh, we're going to pay the bondholders uh, so that the Americans uh, won't lose any money. Well, uh, Russia uh, will say, well, we are, and China will say, we are willing That's to so export nice. to you enough to keep you solvent. Well, you can buy our uh, energy, uh, Russian energy. You can buy Russian crops. However, uh, we know that you don't have the money to pay. We are not going to uh, lend you money that uh, you're simply going to now have enough that you can get by and pay your foreign debts. You're going to have to choose. Do you want to be part of the dollar uh, area or do you want to be part of the new multilateral area? Well, by creating this new multilateral area and a, a bank that will be funded by a combination of domestic currencies put in and uh, something like what Keynes called the bank or uh, paper gold uh, that uh, the bank will simply create uh, to fund. Uh, this will mean that uh, no country in the future will have to behave to any country the way it's behaved toward the United States. Uh -huh. it, won't have, it won't have to impoverish its economy to pay financial debts to China right. or any other country. Uh, uh, as a principle of the international law that has enabled uh, the global south and uh, China and Russia and India and Iran to uh, create this alternative uh, economic order. So there will be a whole different constitution of uh, international finance, international trade, international payments, and international law to the United States. So that uh, the the kind of of unipolarity of financial domination of the world economy can no longer exist, just as uh, there cannot be a financialization of domestic economies in China, Russia, uh, or the global South countries. So the uh, the breaking of uh, becoming independent from uh, the dollarized zone will uh, create a much fairer international system. So this kind of financial imperialism cannot recur on the part of any country. Yes. Yeah, and uh, yes, if, I may, yes, if, if I may add to that, so to the first question about if China becomes the new land money lord of the world, <laughs> yes. I just say that, you know, first of all, well, there are several things I should say. Number one, as I've said, uh, this kind of expectation arises from theories of hegemony, which say, you know, mm -hmm. we had Italian city-states hegemony, Dutch hegemony, British hegemony, mm -hmm. now we have American hegemony, who else will we have next? This mm -hmm. is the wrong theory. Oh, so what that's we that's have that's witnessed that's is the increasing multipolarity of the world so that progressively it has become harder and harder for any country to truly dominate and even British uh, hegemony was never quite what people said, thought it was it was it rested on a vast empire yes but that empire was is today no longer possible and no country can recreate it the record of American military failures Korea it had to accept the partition of Korea. It was defeated in Vietnam. Practically everywhere it has gone, it has failed to actually have a victory. It has destroyed a lot, but it has failed to have a victory. It just goes to show that unless you are dealing with tiny countries like Grenada or Panama, the Americans cannot have a victory, which means no country really. And so that's the first thing. No country can have such domination. Secondly, China emerges from a very different tradition. China is part of the anti-imperialist tradition. And that means something. It's not just in the head. There are certain impulses that are bred into, that are hardwired into the Chinese, the personality of the Chinese party state. And I don't think that that is going to lend itself very well to exercise 
colonizing hegemony uh, or, or domination over the rest of the world. And the third point I'd like to make is that, you know, in people say uh, always, you know, along with this question of whether China will be the next hegemon, which is the wrong question. They also say, well, will the Chinese currency replace the dollar? And I would just add to add to some of the things that uh, Michael has already said. Already at the end of the Second World War, the world was ready to have a multilaterally agreed currency, which would be no, look, look nothing like the sterling system. It would look nothing like the dollar system that we got or non-system that we got instead. It was going to be something based on the mutual agreement, at least of the systemically important countries. And I think that is something like what we are going to get, because quite frankly, if China allowed the type of internationalization of its currency that the Americans have allowed, Chinese industry would go kaput. Chinese industry would not exist because it would uh, involve transforming the Chinese uh, financial sector. And Ch China cannot afford that if it is going to re retain the legitimacy it enjoys among ordinary Chinese people if the party state is going to retain that legitimacy. So that expectation is the wrong one. And finally, even if there were some residual possibility that China is going to become some kind of a big bully on the block, the fact is other countries, you know, people have talked a lot about how China has been a good partner to many other third world countries, particularly, you know, it's a good trade partner, good investment partner, et cetera. But these countries, Take, take Sri Lanka right now. These countries have to do not just one thing, namely partner with China. They have to do two things. Number one, yes, partner with China, but number two, also learn from China. What has what is China doing? Expanding its productive economy, etc. You have to learn from China in order to be, in order to make the most of your partnership with China. Right now, what is ailing Sri Lanka is that the fact is the, and by the way, the, it's uh, financial links with China are heavily exaggerated. Most of Sri Lanka's debt is owed, overwhelming majority of Sri Lanka's debt is owed to the Western countries. But nevertheless, Sri Lanka ran a welfare state without looking after the productive base. You cannot do that. You, if you are going to have a redis good redistributive economy, you have to have a good productive economy and you can learn from China how to do that. So in that sense, I would say that if more and more countries began learning from China, began to say, okay, how do we learn from China to expand our productive economy in an ecologically sustainable fashion, then that would be good. I agree with Barry that uh, US in serious decline is a huge problem. And <coughs> I can only say that there are at least three agents that can do something to manage it. First and foremost are the people of the United States itself. And I think that they have to organize in order to replace the existing broken political system with a better one, with a socialist one. To put not to put too fine a point on it because capitalism in its present capitalism has run its course it cannot take a better form in order to create a better productive economy a rust belt free economy in the united states you're going to need some kind of socialism and it's time to build it now number two the second agent are the allies of the united states they have to stop kowtowing to the united states the germans have to say basta you are destroying our economy we're not going to do what you want us to do so do all all the rest of the Europeans and the Japanese. And I think that this is also going to only come with down pressure from below. And then obviously, finally, uh, uh, I would say that uh, uh, some kind, the rest of the world has to exercise some kind of a restraint because at the end of the day, <clears throat> the United States is the only country in the world to have ever used nuclear weapons, is the only country in the world that used nuclear weapons without any reason for doing so, with no legitimate reason to do so, with no threat facing it. This is a, 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 a ruling class that is uh, kind of out of control and we have to do something. Finally, I will say that on the matter of the left movements and parties in Latin America, I cannot say more uh, about, you know, I cannot praise them enough. I think they need, you know, Lula has to get back into office, but also like all the other, like, like I said about all the other countries, like I said about Sri Lanka, they are, Latin America is benefiting a great deal from China's involvement in the continent, but they really must look into how to create a better productive basis. One of the biggest threats that Latin America faces is to become a sort of 
primary product exporter for the industrial economies of the world, which today primarily means China. And it has to do better than that. Of course, it can do that. I'm not saying no, but it can do better than that. And that requires political organization and political, um, what's the word for it? Uh, yeah, po political organization and planning, basically. So I'll end there. I have to say one thing in response to that. Uh, how uh, can any country increase the productive uh, economy? Uh, in order for Latin America or Africa to uh, spend money uh, on their productive economy, they cannot do that and pay the dollarized debts to the West. They are incompatible. Uh, there has to be a debt cancellation. And I think China should uh, take the lead in this. And uh, all my discussion before of how the world was before 2000 years ago, every, as I mentioned, every Babylonian ruler would begin by canceling the debts. Every, every Near Eastern ruler would cancel the debts. Uh, in Japan, there were revolutions to cancel the debts. All throughout Asia, there were periodic debt cancellation uh, when it was necessary to cancel the debts in order to provide uh, the economy with enough money to go forward. Uh, any uh, political movement or economic movement to rebuild industry has to be done with a clean slate. That means not paying the dollar debts. It's over. The, do the loans that the International Monetary Fund and the bondholders have given to the Global South have not been loans to develop. They are odious debts. They were loans, let's say it, to keep the uh, client oligarchy in power. They were to uh, support the currencies so the oligarchy could move their money out of the currencies because uh, a free market meant there are no capital controls on the, uh, uh, on the uh, amount by which uh, wealthy oligarchies can take out uh, their money. Most of the dollar debts uh, of uh, Argentina and Brazil uh, are owed to Brazilians and Argentinians. The Americans won't touch them because they know that uh, these countries can't pay. But uh, the, uh, the oligarchs in Brazil say, well, we run the central bank. We run the government. Of course, we'll pay the dollar debts because we're paying to ourselves on our offshore, uh, offshore uh, uh, dollar accounts. Uh, as a matter of fact, I worked for Scudder Stevens putting in place in 1990, the first uh, third world sovereign debt fund. And uh, we could only sell uh, our uh, Argentinian and Brazilian debts to, in Argentina and Brazil. So uh, you, you have to get rid of the oligarchy. Uh, you talk about uh, socialist reform in America. Uh, that's not possible. It's unconstitutional. It's uh, the Supreme Court. We can't even have uh, global uh, environmental laws against global warming. It's unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional for women to have abortions in the United States. It's unconstitutional to uh, let uh, anyone run for president who cannot raise money on Wall Street. The, the, the political campaigns are run by campaign contributors. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, it is unconstitutional to avoid uh, the United States going down, uh, polarizing and going down and down and like a frog in the uh, water being boiled and boiled until it slowly dies. Uh, there's a slow crash in the United States. There's no uh, opportunity to make a third party in the United States that's unconstitutional, according to state, uh, state constitutions. There, uh, there is, it's not possible for the government, the federal government, to have any power, which you would need under any socialist uh, regime, because the Constitution was written by slave owners that wanted states' rights, the ability of minorities, to prevent any attempt to free the slaves initially, uh, and then after slavery entered, any attempt uh, to provide a pro-labor, pro-environmental, pro-democratic policy, unconstitutional. So you cannot expect the United States to reform itself uh, only to undergo a slow crash. And uh, as Marx uh, said, uh, the end of capitalism is not going to be a pretty sight. And uh, as the United States uh, loses its, uh, its power, that's not going to be uh, a political, uh, a pretty sight. Uh, I, I worked uh, for many years with the Hudson Institute, a national security institute. Uh, I uh, often was brought to the National War College. Uh, I met with uh, 
uh, with, with the generals. Uh, you say the atomic bomb was not necessary. Of course it was necessary. It was uh, worth bombing Japan so that the Russians would not uh, uh, move their, have an influence uh, over Japan. It was necessary to show the world, we are willing to blow up your country if you don't do what we want. It was necessary to atom bomb Japan so MacArthur could come in, uh, hire the Yakuza, the gangs, to murder the socialists, to, uh, to uh, jail the socialists, and to create uh, the right-wing dictatorship uh, uh, of a client oligarchy that uh, Japan has today, uh, uh, in today's society. Uh, the, uh, the military people, uh, and most of all, the political people, not so much the military, but the State Department people said, it is necessary for us to not only to be the, have the ability to use the atom bomb, but actually to use it if there's any threat to uh, our power or the power of the client oligarchies that we back in the Near East and Latin America and others. Uh, I've met these people. They want to use the atomic bomb personally. They talk about using it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could? How can we create? These are mentally sick people. Uh, and yet they are, in, they are the people that uh, President Biden has appointed in charge of the State Department. And uh, you're dealing with, with madmen. And you, uh, you. you, both of you have said, uh, talked about Donald Trump uh, being a charlatan. Uh, he was elected president because he was the lesser evil. The danger was Hillary Clinton who did want to use the atom bomb. If she were in power, she has, is the most militarist uh, of all. That's one of the reasons that people voted for Trump instead of her. He was the lesser evil. Thank you. Now, we don't have much time left. Thank you both uh, so much for this uh, uh, discussions and uh, answering the questions. Now, I have to come to those questions by Chinese audience. There are several already. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not even see them uh, because they put it into uh, my uh, WeChat. Uh, I have to read them in uh, Chinese, but you definitely can easily listen to the, still in the same channel, I think English channel, the interpreters will translate them into uh, English. Uh, the, I read several questions uh, together, and then you can organize your answer. The first question is a question to Professor Hudson. So you mentioned that we need to build a strong government to fight against the oligarchy, but what should we make of the fact that uh, in the in the state and cap? Uh, what should we make of the fact that the state capitalism assess Lenin in state and revolution? Because the state capitalism, as according to Lenin, that will inevitably form bureaucratic monopoly capitalism, who are also like a kind of oligarchy. And the second question is also uh, a question to. Professor Hudson, so you have repeatedly stated that debt cancellation is necessary. However, for different groups within a country, some people have access through debt, while others have nothing. They don't have debt either. Is it unfair to those who are not in debt if there is a debt cancellation? How to balance this imbalance caused by a clean slate? Well, if somebody's not in debt, it's because they're fortunate enough to uh, not to have to go into debt. Uh, th this was uh, every single ancient society uh, had the same problem. And for thousands of years, the idea was uh, you have to let everybody have a free start. And uh, you want to avoid uh, people having been driven into debt. It's very nice that many people are not driven into debt. Uh, but you can't say, we are going to uh, make uh, more and more people fall deeper and deeper into debt uh, and uh, die early and uh, uh, be impoverished just so uh, uh, you won't have to uh, uh, be on the same level as them. Uh, that's uh, completely uh, arrogant. Uh, the, the objective is to protect the weak and the poor. 
That's what every ancient religion said uh, was the job of the ruler. Uh, you had the justice goddesses uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Babylonia uh, and Sumer saying uh, you have to protect uh, the poor. If someone that you want is in debt, they're poor and you want to uh, get rid of it. So of course uh, you have to. Uh, regarding what Lenin said in State and Revolution, uh, well, uh, of course you don't want uh, uh, the kind of Stalinist uh, bureaucracy uh, to develop. And uh, uh, China was able so far to avoid that. Uh, uh, all you, uh, I, in every country where you uh, prevented a bureaucracy taking place, it's required a revolution by force. It's required a population to uh, take action to preserve uh, uh, a government that actually serves them. I think uh, in America, Benjamin Franklin said, we are a republic, you are a republic if you can keep it. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, China uh, is uh, the effectively uh, a democracy because uh, it has the Communist Party doing what a democracy should do. Provide, promoting the prosperity of the people. Uh, it's necessary for the people uh, to be vigilant. Uh, uh, that's uh, the challenge of any, any country. We don't know how uh, Russia is going to uh, solve the problem of the kleptocrats that the neoliberals have put in place. Uh, we don't know how other countries will solve this, uh, but it has uh, an, a knowledge of history, including ancient history and where Western civilization went wrong uh, will certainly give you a guide in as to what to avoid. There's another another question also about debt, about how to uh, the clean slate for, uh, for for the global south. So this question is also to Professor Hudson. How do you think the global south can start the process of of a clean slate? Because many developing countries they are relying on dollar debt for their international uh, and even domestic spending once they start to refuse to pay back their debt won't they be sanctioned by the us well the answer is of course the united states is going to treat any country that uh withdraws from its financial system uh in the same way it treated russia and china uh the uh that is going to force these countries to choose do they want to be part of the U.S. order or part of the emerging uh, Eurasian uh, order? And uh, uh, they, uh, if they remain in the U.S. order, it's certain that uh, they they will going to end up in debt bondage. Uh, the only hope they have is to move with uh, China and Russia, and then they can say to the United States, "Well, we're not going to pay the debts, but uh, we certainly would like to." Uh, export some of our, our our materials to you and to buy from you uh are you going if you put sanctions against us you're going to be punishing your own exporters if you what do we buy from the united states the only thing we buy from the united states are food uh and uh arms we're not going to buy your arms because we're not going to go to war with anyone certainly not with your arms uh we're going to try to feed ourselves and uh, Russia can sort of beat us. We don't need the United States. Uh, and uh, the question is, what about uh, America's satellites like Europe? Uh, the uh, Latin America and Africa can say, well, we'd like to buy your European exports. Uh, if you want to have uh, uh, American sanctions against us, then you will kill your own export industries and you will be uh, condemning your own industrial uh, base uh, to unemployment and you'll end up a, a rust belt, just like the United States the Midwest has become. Uh, do you want that? Or do you want to have a multipolar world? And why don't you Europeans and uh, other American satellites join the Eurasian New World Order? That's basically the diplomatic uh, strategy that uh, is logical to evolve. How do, do you make any comments on the BRICS or BRICS recently, uh, BRICS plus two? as an emergent counter hegemonic force in the global political economy. Could you make any comments, both of you? My comment is simply, yes. I'll let Radica elaborate. Sure, thanks, Michael. Um, I think that, you know, in some senses, um, you know, the rhetoric of 
the new Cold War sometimes can be questioned and sometimes there are interesting parallels. So this is a case in which there are interesting parallels because you go to go back to the old Cold War, the original Cold War. What you had was the communist bloc confronting the capitalist bloc, but also a very large number of third world countries leaning distinctly leftwards and leaning distinctly towards the communist bloc, which together constituted a sort of, you know, various groupings like the non-aligned movement, the group of 77, they together created UNCTAD. And in the end, in the 1970s, they campaigned for a new international economic order. And I think in, a, in different circumstances, that agenda is back on the table. Michael has already talked about the reform of international economic governance, beginning with, uh, you know, which includes rather, I should say, the reform of the international monetary system, roughly along the lines that Keynes recommended uh, uh, at the end of the Second World War, but which the United States did not allow to be realized. Uh, this matter was also, by the way, very interestingly raised by the governor of the People's Bank of China, right, hot on the heels of the 2008 financial crisis, at which point also lots of people were beginning to say that there's something deeply wrong with the dollar system. And again, that's something that I've argued in my geopolitical economy, Michael and I argued more recently. So beginning with that, but also going to other forms, like what is the form that trade must take? If you go back to the original Havana Charter, you see in that the principles of an international trade system that is designed for the mutual benefit of all countries, not for some, uh, uh, some productively powerful countries to destroy others. This has happened, uh, you know, uh, enough times on, on a world scale that we do not need that to happen. I think countries need to create sustainable and uh, uh, how can you say, uh, yeah, sustainable in both in, in a, in a long-term sense as well as in an ecological sense, productive foundations for their needs of their own people. It's not being provincial at all. In fact, that allows countries to relate to one another on a mutually beneficial basis. So to make a long story short, I would say that the rise of the BRICS, the rise of uh, other uh, alternative institutions that are centered around China, whether it's the uh, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or the RESEP and so on, these are all all the building blocks of a new form of international economic governance, which moves away from, very critically, moves away from the kind of imperialism that we have had in the past. Because the thing is, if you think about it, the high point of imperialism was 1914. But partly because the United States was able to get the cooperation of the major capitalist powers, this system kind of was extended into the post-war period it is no longer sustainable. Most of the Europeans recognize it, which is partly why they have, at least until the early this year, they have managed to create good relations with China and Russia, and they know that they have to do that. But anyway, my point is simply that this is the kind of system we need to, to bring into existence, which is for mutual benefit and not for the domination. NATO, the IMF, the World Bank, et cetera, all of these were the arms of an, of, a, of an imperial system which was trying to prolong its life, even though it was sort of its time was up. So, yeah. Thank you again so much. I think basically the time is up and uh, I like to thank you both so much for providing such an excellent, excellent, uh, insightful explanation and analysis of both ancient uh, more than uh, the current uh, problems of crisis and how the, there can be a, something they call the collapse or a decline of the Western civilization or imperialist uh, hegemony headed by the US. And uh, also thanks to all the questions, you know, we did not uh, manage, uh, I did not manage to control the time for every pieces, but basically we cover or you to cover all the questions apart from some comments. I did not uh, read that.